Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. So this talk is going to cover two different areas of new, relatively new security research. There's security economics, which is using the field of economics to explain why some things in security don't work, how to improve them, and also help us understand new ways in which computer security is going to be used. Because it's not just protecting people from bad guys, but it's also maintaining the economic viability of the people who are keeping you in your jobs. So it's turned out to be a very powerful way of understanding security to look at economics. People have been studying economics for a lot longer in computer security, and it turns out there's quite a lot to learn. Although security and computing in general is quite different from most markets, and so there are quite a few differences between how you have to analyze security systems and how you would analyze um, producing things in a st standard factory. But security economics does have limitations, and these have been recognized. So subsequent to the research in security economics, people started looking at psychology. What psychology does is appreciates that humans are not robots. They don't um, behave like the mathematical formulas that e economics assumes that they behave like. And there's various ways of using the way that we understand the difference between the theoretical and actual human behavior that can be used for understanding different types of failure in security. One group of people who have been particularly successful at understanding how humans behave have been scammers. In some ways, they've been far more successful than the security communi community in understanding how to get people to carry out their behavior. But um, they're obviously doing this for the wrong reasons. Still, there are some ways that we can learn from them. So I'm going to show some examples from a program called The Real Hustle, and this demonstrates ways that scammers use to manipulate humans into doing the wrong things, and so maybe you'll be able to learn these techniques in order to manipulate humans into doing the right things, and also detecting when criminals are trying to do the wrong thing with your users. So on security economics, the reason that this field started was that there was an uh, understanding that just looking at the pure technology was insufficient. It's just looking at the technology would illustrate things like why a particular bit of software failed, but it wouldn't explain why that bit of software got deployed, why was it designed in such a poor way, and why was it used in the market in, in an appropriate way. One of the conclusions of security economics is that a lot of wrong things occur when there is imperfect information between different parties. And so we're also going to look at how people who need to have the information, in particular the consumers who make purchasing decisions, if they get more information, they can actually work on improving the security of the overall system. And then, as I mentioned, security is increasingly being used to preserve revenue streams, not just to keep the bad guys out. If you've got a phone, then if it's got any sort of digital rights management on it, this is one example of where security is being used to maintain economics rather than to maintain more traditional quant um, properties of computer security. Traditionally, computer security was seen as being bad because there were insufficient technology. So maybe that if we just had a few more bits of firewall, if we had better cryptography, if we used the cryptography that we had, um, if we were able to um, authenticate who users are, then all these problems like spam and malware, um, computer hacking would go away. So there's been leaps and bounds in development of all these sorts of technologies. 
We've now got crypto that works pretty well. We've got authentication that works pretty well. Firewalls that certainly exist. They probably don't work as well as we hope, but they certainly do do useful things. Yet still, computer security is in a terrible state. So even though we've got all these technologies that basically do what they're supposed to do, why are these things not failing? We can try to explain this through a few examples, which seem counterintuitive. These were systems where you had smart people working, you had plenty of technology, but still the security was bad. So the first case study is electronic banking in the UK. The UK banks were spending more on money, more in terms of money on security, yet they were seeing higher levels of fraud than the American banks, which were seeing for relatively low levels of fraud. One reason to explain this was that the liability regime in the UK and the US is significantly different. In the US, it's fairly easy to sue a bank and get your money back, and therefore the banks are very likely to give your money back in pretty much every case. In the UK, it's extremely hard to sue a bank. If you want to challenge anything about transactions in your account which you disagree with, then you'll probably have to go through one of the dispute resolution systems which are stacked in the bank's favour. The banks know this, and so they have put their resources into making sure that customers are held liable rather than trying to reduce fraud. Another strange thing that happened is that it's extraordinarily hard to persuade people to install antivirus software on their computer. You could make it free and they still want to do it. They want to install security updates. But when you think about the economics behind this, it starts to make sense. If you get a virus, chances are it will not affect you. It will affect other people. And this is something called an externality, where your actions cause someone else to incur cost. And another set of problems are to do with health records and, in, generally, in general, administrative record systems. These have very poor privacy properties. They often run massively over budget. They don't actually do what they promise, and they don't support the people who are supposed to be using the system. One reason that this occurs is that the people who are buying this software are not the people who are actually using it. It's certainly not the people whose records are being held, and it's almost certainly not the doctors who are going to be using the system on a day-to-day -day basis. It's administrators, and these administrators are ensure that the system will give them the information they want, and they don't have that much incentive in making sure that it does the job that it was supposed to. And the final example I will go into is the problem of Microsoft. So Microsoft Windows now is relatively secure, but a few years ago, it was completely terrible. This wasn't just a personal failing on Bill Gates' perspective, on Bill Gates' personality. This was done for very rational and very good reasons, and we can use economics to look into that in some more detail. But before those examples, we'll have a look a bit about new uses of security mechanisms. So I mentioned about your phones implementing DRM to make sure that Apple keeps its money coming in from buying, having you buy music through them. But another interesting case is in printer cartridges. So printer cartridges, whether these are inkjet printers or laser printers, now very frequently will come with quite sophisticated cryptographic processor on them in order to authenticate the printer cartridge to the printer. And if the printer doesn't recognize this printer cartridge, then it will reject it. But they can also do some more subtle things. So for example, the cryptographic processor will sometimes check the level of toner or ink in the cartridge. And if it ever sees this going up, then it will flag this as an intrusion event and it will stop working. Now, that made some people upset, so it started to get into a bit of an arms race where things were even more underhanded. And some printer cartridges, when they detected that something would be refilled, 
they wouldn't just stop working, but they would half the resolution. So you're buying the replacement toner or replacement ink, probably from the same factory that made the real toner and the real ink, yet it appears to be working less well, so you're more likely to buy the original manufacturer. Um, toner from the original manufacturer at massively increased rate, and this so sort of functionality allowed the printer manufacturers to sell their printers at a loss and make their money back on the toner. Now, there have been huge fights in the courts about whether this is legal or not. There was one company which um, produced compatible printer cartridges. Uh, this was SCC. Um, Lexmark sued them under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act for infringing their copyright because they copied some aspects of the cryptographic processor when they were doing this, and Lexmark won. The similar case happened in the European Union, but there the decision went the opposite way. The reason was it was decided that, um, all, firstly, the DMCA does not apply in the European Union, and secondly, by preventing people from replacing and refilling their toner cartridges was a violation of environmental regulations. And so it was environmental regulations which decided that case. <coughs> Another set of examples where cryptography is used for economic reasons is accessory controls. So if you want to plug something into your Apple device, then it's got to have a chip that's been authorised by Apple. There's the trusted platform module, at least it was intended for digital rights management, but it never really worked. Maybe the next versions will start working. And then there's also the question about cryptography um, when you have um, some sort of network intelligence. So you've got smartphones, which are probably ha have more powerful CPUs than the base stations that they talk to, but still the operators want to maintain control. And one way they do this is through crypt cryptography. They do things like you can't install firmware unless it's appropriately hashed, and um, you can't talk to the network unless you do some cryptographic, uh, cryptographic authentication. So the conclusions that we can get from this is that economics is very useful for explaining these things. So things like um, liability dumping, externalities, were all aspects of economics that have been extensively studied. And we can apply some of the solutions to the, these problems in order to better resolve these computer security problems. So, for example, one canonical example of an externality is pollution. So, a company can have a factory, they dump the waste product into the water, and then the water gets polluted. It doesn't affect the company very much, but it does affect others who are downstream of that, the people who are using it for their water supply. The way that we try to resolve that in economics is through government regulation, and that is in place to deal with market failures. A conclusion of economics is that although economics is um, having a free market is optimal for some circumstances, it can fail terribly in others, and that's when there has to be some intervention. And that's why even countries like the US, which pride themselves as being a free market economy, have extensive government regulation. Arguably, so some people would claim that there's too much, some people claim that there's too, too little, but very few people who now realistically claim that there should be none. But we can't just copy and paste the standard economics textbooks onto security, because IT economics is very significantly different. One is network effects. This was originally um, discussed by Bob Metcalf, one of the inventors of Ethernet, trying to explain why was it useful to connect computers together because at that stage, this was a strange and controversial idea. Ethernet was very expensive, token ring was even more expensive. What was the point of using these in the first place, when you already had computers and you could already move data between computers? And what he said is that the value of a network is not proportional to the number of computers in this network, the number of nodes, 
it's proportional to the number of links between these computers. So if I can communicate to one person, then that's good. If you add another person on there, then I can communicate to one extra, people, one extra person, but now the network value is two. But since those two people can now communicate together, that means the network's three. So I've added one person and got two units of value. And when you look at how this scales for larger numbers, it scales with the order of n squared. So you can approximate the value of a network being the square of the number of nodes. Now there's been some further analysis of this by economists, and they suggest that the value of network is actually closer to n log n. It doesn't really matter, but the important conclusion is that the value of a network scales more than linearly with the number of nodes in the network. And a consequence of that is there's always an incentive to join together two different networks. And this ends up being resulting in winner takes all. So in the case of networks, the internet is effectively the one network. Almost every network is connected to the internet. There wouldn't be any sense in someone setting up a second internet because no one would join it because everyone's already on the first one. Back when the internet was being released to consumers, there were a few attempts at that. AOL, CompuServe had their wall garden where you could join their network and then hopefully you would be able to do interesting things there. But there was so much pressure to join the internet that those products no longer exist in the original ways that they were developed. You can also see similar patterns with mobile phones. There is now two dominant platforms they've managed to settle in this sort of situation. And there, everyone else is being squeezed. So Windows and BlackBerry are almost at negligible values. And it's going to be incredibly hard for them to justify being able to make it into the larger leaks of mobile app stores. And the same with social networks. There are dozens of different social networks, but Facebook and LinkedIn are the ones who have won. Everyone wants to join Facebook because that's where their friends are, and that causes these networks to grow and grow, and the other ones to wither and die. Another strange aspect of IT compared to the rest of the world is about the very high fixed costs that are required for developing software. Developing the first copy of the software is incredibly expensive, and producing the second one is almost free. It's just one extra CD or one extra internet download. <coughs> and this is termed in economics as being high fixed cost for making this first one, and then low marginal cost for making each additional one. As a consequence, competition would normally drive the cost down to the marginal cost of the producer. So the cost of Windows or Office would be the cost of um, the CD that gets producing it. And that would prevent anyone from producing software again. And that's why we need things like copyrights and patents to recover this initial capital investment in order to allow people to maintain producing software and interesting hardware. Now there's debate about exactly how these should be used. Patents are probably counterproductive in IT because they were designed for different markets. Copyright is particularly problematic. But something like these is probably going to be necessary in IT because of this high fixed cost and low marginal costs. Another thing that most of you will have encountered is it's very expensive to switch from one software suite to another software suite. So if you use Microsoft Office and you want to switch to OpenOffice, even though there's been quite a lot of effort done to make these two things compatible, it's still annoying, expensive to do this. And similarly, it's very expensive to switch from Windows to Mac or vice versa. One conclusion of economics is that the value of a company is the total switching costs of all of its customers. And that means that companies will work hard to try to pe keep people on their platform. 
that will make it very easy to stay and very expensive to switch, and that's what makes that company valuable. And you can see technology being used to implement this. So if you've got all your music locked up in iTunes, and then that probably means that you're going to buy an iPod when your current media player breaks rather than going to something else. So there are some ways of reducing these fixed costs, but that's not always going to work. And even things like Angry Birds does require quite good programmers to work on it to get the first version. And that gets them into the market, and they got quite a bit of money from that. But what's been very successful at Angry Birds is it's a franchise, and they have been continuing. And I think the amount of money that goes into, first of all, making new versions and marketing these new versions is quite substantial. So I think regardless of how cheap it's going to be to do software development, it's still going to be dramatically different to, um, to produce one, the next version of the software, which is the cost of some software download versus producing the, the first version of it. So maybe the balance is going to change. I think the balance is changing. But these sorts of effects are not going to go away. And so I think the implications of like copyright and patents, something like that being necessary, is probably going to stay as well. OK. So another consequence of these fixed costs and marginal costs is a big first mover um, advantage. So the company which is first into the market, starts getting users, gets quite frequently the rest of the market. Certainly that they're at a massive advantage. This doesn't always happen. So Facebook came fairly late to the social network game, but they were still able to win. But if someone else comes along and has a better Facebook, they're going to have to put up with a tremendous amount of inertia before they actually get anyone. As a consequence, time to market is one of the critical components of commercial success. This is one reason that startups can be quite successful in the IT industry. And it's also one reason that patents are potentially less useful than they're supposed to be, which is that by the time the patent process has actually gone through, the market has already decided who's going to win. This also explains why Microsoft software was for so long quite poor quality and also quite insecure. The first thing that they did is they realized that they had to be at the market first. So the attitude was, we'll ship it by Tuesday and get it right by, pers uh, by version 3. And that's what they did. They managed to lock the market in with mediocre software, and then they had the opportunity to actually improve it. And if they hadn't done that, then probably one of their competitors would. So it's almost inevitable. If you just have market forces acting, then you're going to have this first of all, effort to get be the first to market, and secondly, you're going to end up with dominant players in the market. In order to make money off security, um, or off IT in general, you want to be as big as possible because of these um, high fixed costs and low marginal costs, and the extreme of this is to be um, a monopoly. The way that you get to be a monopoly in IT is to appeal to complementers. So there's no point in um, trying to produce a new video player if you don't get people to use the video format that you support. That was why there was, we had the video format wars before some standardization. And we can see the same thing with um, 
all the different companies who are producing platforms for running apps. They try very hard to make it easy for people to develop apps on those platforms. Sometimes they even pay people to develop apps on those platforms because people will go towards a platform where there are apps available. One way that Microsoft were very successful about doing this is to disable security. As you all know, security gets in the way. And if you have less security, then it's easier to develop apps. You don't need to worry very much about being careful with memory protections. You don't have to um, compartmentalize your program so you have least privilege. You can just forget about all these things and get the app to market as fast as possible. And that's one of the reasons why Microsoft became so dominant. Another consequence from IT security is it's quite easy to dump responsibility from, um, for security technologies onto the users. And we can see this sort of thing happening with SSL, for example, TLS. When you are going on the web, on the, web the certification authorities don't make any effort to establish whether the people with these certificates are good. They only make mediocre attempts to make sure that they are who they say they are. But what they do try to give you is massive amounts of information that users are extremely unlikely to understand. So they show you different color padlocks, they show you contents of X509 certificates, and this gives people, in theory, the ability to make security decisions, and therefore, arguably, the responsibility to make security decisions, and therefore, the costs have been dumped on the, com on the computer user. We can also see how economics is explain successes. So nowadays, SSH has more or less taken over from Telnet. This wasn't because it's more secure, but because it does, does some extra things. It worked better in a few non-security ways. So for example, you were able to forward X over it, and that caused people to adopt it, and they got the better security for free. This also c explains why some technologies have been very hard to deploy. So BGP is the protocol used to control internet routing. It allows networks to declare how to get onto other networks via them, and it's the way the internet works. It has effectively no authentication and therefore extraordinarily insecure. There may have been some hacks against it, but it's very hard to say. There have been some big accidents that have happened because of a lack of security. Uh, one was a Pakistani ISP decided that they wanted to block YouTube to their customers because there was something offensive on it. And the way they did this was to configure their routers to send YouTube data or requests going to YouTube to one of their servers where they'd either drop it or show a warning message or something like that. But they pushed the wrong buttons and they, rather than just routing their users' YouTube traffic to their computer, they started routing the world's YouTube traffic to their computer. So their computer fell over, their entire network fell over. This was a small ISP um, rather than being YouTube. And they were eventually managed to fix this. Um, YouTube managed to fix this by splitting their network in two and then advertising two separate networks. And smaller networks get priority to bigger networks and therefore YouTube started getting their traffic back, and also that ISP started getting cut off from the rest of the internet. But if someone can take over YouTube by accident, then maybe someone could take over another website uh, deliberately. So that's why there's some desire to have a secure version of BGP. This, in practice, is not being used because if you adopt it, you don't get any benefit. It's only if the whole network adopts it is that there's any benefit. And the same with DNSSEC. DNSSEC is now getting deployed, but it's far, far be slower than the original goals. One reason behind this is that until lots of people are using it, there's no benefit in publishing DNS records. And until lots of people are using it, there's no benefit in checking DNS records. And so it was really only through government pushes, particularly the US government pushing DNSSEC as being mandatory for some purposes, that we ended up seeing any DNSSEC deployment. So the 
conclusions that we can get from the differences between standard economics and IT is that there are, are some beneficial aspects and some negative aspects. So the things that are good is that IT industry is quite fast moving and it's flexible. If you deploy a product that's not so good, then hopefully you can update it, you can change software to do all sorts of amazing things. But a consequence of this flexibility is that there is a desire to make software more complex. It's already extraordinarily complex and it can be made more so. Therefore, there are some reasons why you end up with failures which are a result from pushing more complexity into the software when it really should be elsewhere. One example of this was one of the NASA Mars landers which crashed. This was a computer failure. Um, there was a problem with the propulsion system and the detection system for when it landed that caused it to disable the rockets too early and it crashed. There were lots of reasons behind this. One was a, an intention to reduce cost, but partially it was because the software in this Mars lander, in particular the engine control unit, was far more complex than in previous cases. And the reason is that previously the rocket motor was variable over a fairly large analog range. So if you wanted to move slower, then you turn a screw, there'd be less fuel going in and you'd go slower. If you wanted to go faster, then you could undo the screw and then it would go a bit faster. This process of changing the fuel flow is quite um, difficult to implement in hardware. So this Mars lander had a cost saving measure where the rocket motor could either be on or off. And then they had software deal with the complexity. So it'd monitor where it is, it would turn the rocket motor on and off and so on. And the software was so complex that it turned out there were far more bugs in it than the software controlling the previous versions. And that was one of the reasons that the Mars lander crashed. There's also problems that come from economics um, that really apply to IT security. So IT security systems are under far wider scale attack than normal security systems. Um, you will almost certainly have emails, perhaps in your spam folder, about various types of fraud. And also, there is a much greater tendency to end up with monopolies in IT and all the bad things that come from these, so increased cost, lower quality of service. And when you have all these problems, it's inevitable that some regulation is going to be necessary. But how can we try to cope? Uh, we've seen this in the news in the past few days that the European Union fined Microsoft a massive amount of money for um, being uh, a monopoly player in the browser market. But it's really unclear that the regulation was optimal in this case because it just took so long. This court case was motivated by Netscape and Netscape were out of business long before the case even came to court. So it didn't help Netscape. Um, even Opera, it's not clear whether they helped and Opera moving over to um, the WebKit engine anyway. So we've ended up with um, almost a monopoly despite the intervention of the European Union. One of the key papers in, um, in the understanding of computer security through economics was a paper in 2001 by Ross Anderson, where he looked at um, George Akerlof's paper called A Market for Lemons. So this won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2001, and it looked at the market for second-hand cars. So the idea was that there were two types of second-hand cars on the market. There were peaches and there were lemons. So the peach would be fine and the lemon would break down as soon as you took it home. Of course, everyone wanted to buy a peach and not a lemon, but they couldn't tell the difference. On the other hand, the people selling the cars could tell the difference and they could choose whether they wanted to sell a peach or a lemon. Now, of course, the it's more expensive to get a good car and a bad car, so the cost to the seller of uh, a good car 
is going to be higher than a bad car. And similarly, customers are going to be willing to pay substantially more for a good car than they were willing to pay for a bad car. But they can't tell the difference. So what they're going to do is they're going to pay the um, amount um, that they think they would expect to get in value. So if the market is going to be mainly peaches, then they won't pay the full value of a peach, but they'll pay almost much, almost as much. But if the market is almost lemons, then they'll only pay the value of a lemon. And when you run a simulation of this scenario over a long period of time, what happens is the customers are not willing to pay the cost of a peach because there's a high chance they're going to get a lemon. So then the people who are selling cars will never sell a peach because they don't have the money to do that and then the market is full of lemons. And this shows how if customers don't have access to full information then they're going to end up with um, a market which doesn't sell any good products. <coughs> and software in many respects, particularly software security, is a market for lemons. So if you go along to conferences like RSA, you will see, see lots of different security products with lots of shiny marketing brochures, but there's really no way for a user to tell whether this antivirus is better than that antivirus or whether this firewall is better than that firewall. And this gives the people who are selling the products an incentive to do it as cheaply and as poorly as possible because no one is going to pay for the investment necessary to make a good product. And this is going to continue unless there is better information that's shared about how good products actually are. One way of establishing how good products are that's been examined is a market for vulnerabilities. So here, a market, um, someone producing some software would say, um, if I get some information about a bug, then I will give some money. At the time that this paper was proposed in 2002, this sounded a very outlandish idea, but not very long afterwards, it, this sort of situation started to happen. So firstly, it wasn't the vendors themselves offering this money, it was third parties. People like iDefense and Tipping Point would give security researchers money if they reported a security vulnerability. These companies would then go on and tell the company who owned the software which had the security vulnerability. But what this company would also do is try to extract some value from this vulnerability. They would do this by selling a product which would block incoming attacks in the firewall. And what we then started to see is that a market did start developing for vulnerabilities. So costs of vulnerabilities in secure software went up because there were fewer of them. Um, the cost of vulnerabilities in poor software went down and we could start to actually compare the security between bits of software. But one of the conclusions is the, um, of Stuart Schechter's paper in 2002 is that you should not rationally rely on a bit of software if the amount of money you can get from a bug is going to be less than how much you rely on that software. The reason is that suppose someone can um, find a vulnerability in a bit of software. They have a choice. Do they try to attack someone or do they try to give it to one of these bodies who will do something responsible for it? So if they can use this bug to hack an organisation and get a million pounds, whereas they can get £10,000 off one of these bug bounty vulnerability programmes, then they'll probably use it for attacking. And therefore, you should not rely on the system for any more than £10,000. Now, in practice, the amount of money that is being offered by these bug bounty programmes is fairly pathetic to the amount of money that is being relied upon um, in these sorts of products. This isn't necessarily a sign that the system is entirely broken because there are some incentives to 
give the vulnerability information to the vendor rather than using it to attacking for the purposes of attack. But it does support the quite uh, rational conclusion that the people are putting a lot of trust in software, which probably doesn't actually deserve that trust. Steve, maybe this is yep. covered by your last bullet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are not malicious in intent typically, and so they're likely to participate in the bug bounty program. Do we know what the impact of them participating in the vendor's project or fixing it is on reducing the number of OAs that are found in the wild? Yeah, we don't, we don't really know. There are, there are some theories, um, and this really depends on the probability that a, a vulnerability will be found a second time. So if a vulnerability is only ever going to be found worse at uh, once, there's no point in actually looking for it because if you fix it, then chances are they'll have no implication on anything because someone won't then subsequently come along and find it which you didn't fix and then use that for attacking. But there is some research that shows that it's actually fairly likely for bugs to be found twice. Even though there's a very high bug density, the types of bugs that are found tend to be similar in ways of finding it to previous ones. So um, some one time this particular fuzzing technique will become popular and then everyone will use that and then find all the bugs that are possible to find by this fuzzing technique and they will all fall out. And there might be 10 times as many bugs that aren't found, but it's quite likely the bugs that will be found and exploited will be the same ones. And that sort of conclusion does lead to bug bounties being considered a good thing, but I'd say that there is still not universal consensus on that. Okay. Yeah, so do feel free to ask any questions that you have. So what I've shown is that there are many ways that economics can be very desirable. Um, and building markets around computer security can lead to beneficial things. But this doesn't mean that economics is a silver bullet that will solve all your problems. So when we look at things like spam and phishing and malware, this isn't just um, an issue of um, code being badly written. It's part of it, but it's not all of it. But also, it's the various incentives at play here. So you can defeat a lot of these vulnerabilities by not enabling JavaScript, but then you get access to a very much poorer experience on the web. And so partly this is to the, all these vulnerabilities are to do with web designers using these fancy technologies. And that is because they don't have the incentive to do anything else. Another example of information asymmetry is distinguishing between um, legitimate and <coughs> illegitimate websites. So if you go on the web and search for Tiffany because you're interested in buying some jewellery, then most of the websites that you'll find there will probably not be Tiffany. The websites will take your money and then either give you a substandard product or more likely no products at all. So the way that this is trying to be solved in a market is through um, security seals. You'll occasionally see these on websites at the bottom. It will say something like, um, this website is certified secure, or this website signs up to, to this certification scheme, and therefore, you should be safe in giving your money to that. And what the, some research showed is it actually was counterproductive. These security seals were more likely to indicate that this site was insecure than indicating that it was secure. So that was presented in a paper by Benny Doman. Um, this was at the WISE conference, the Workshop in Economics and Information Security. This is a conference that's still running and is the, the conference that most of the publications in this field end up getting presented at. And what he looked at was um, websites from the Site Advisor database. This is a product by McAfee, which categorizes websites in terms of being good or bad. It's not perfect, it's approximately correct. 
what they look at is um, if you give your email address to this website, are you likely to get some spam? Um, are you likely to download malware? Does this website link to other bad websites? And try to come up with some metrics for whether something is good or bad. And they found that, on average, 2.5% um, of websites were bad. But if you now restricted your uh, interest to websites which were trustee certified as being good, then they were about twice as likely to be bad, which is exactly the opposite that you would like to, um, like to have. And there was a similar result when it came to advertisements. So if you do a Google search for a particular term, then it's much more likely that the adverts are going to be linking to bad websites than the organic search results below. And this is terrible news if you're a search engine um, because it means that people are more, it should have an incentive to not click on adverts and they should instead click on other links. And this is the one reason that advertisers like Google are working very hard in order to reduce the amount of bad stuff on the internet because this is really in their interest to do so. So when you've got problems, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, you said two slides ago that if you have a certificate from trustee, it's yep. more likely to be changed. Yes. But shouldn't then the numbers be like 51% of the sites analyzed were malicious? Because now I can see like 95 out of 100 sites will be good sites, and 5% of that scam will be bad sites. Yes. So th this is saying that if you see a website, um, so if you see a, a website with one of these certificates, then it's probably good. It's 95% it's good. But if it didn't have one of these certificates, then by these results, it would be 98% likely to be good. So having one of these certificates makes it twice as likely that this website is bad. It doesn't mean that it's, it's more likely to be bad than good. And the reason that this is, is that if you're a good website and you're someone like Apple or Microsoft and you've got adverts on television, then people trust you. They, they have, they've heard your name before and they think that they can come after you if anything goes wrong. But if you're a dodgy site, then you don't have that automatic trust and so you're there for more inclined to go out and get one of these certificates to try to increase the amount of trust in your website. I think Trusty were not very happy about this research. Um, they said that they would look into it and that they would improve their mechanisms for dealing with it, but um, in general not very much changed from that perspective. Um, but what did change is that the advertisers started to get very worried because it meant that people would be less likely to actually click on links, click on advert links. And so I think the advertisers have had more results from this research than the people who are selling these certificates. I'm not even sure if these businesses are still in business anymore. It's been a long time since I've seen a trustee certificate. Okay, so it's still there. Okay. Yeah, so if you do have these sorts of problems, then you have something that's called a market failure. You've got externalities, you've got liability, um, dumping, um, you've got um, improper information being communicated to customers, and the answer to this from economics is that you should regulate. But this is incredibly complicated and incredibly controversial in the IT industry. Um, so there are a few possibilities. Um, I'd be interested in your views, what you think about these. So. One is, how about if you got the government to require search engines to devote more resources to policing content? Um, they would definitely not like to do that. That's very expensive to do, but that's one potential solution. Um, another one would be to assign liability to certification bodies if they were granted without proper vetting. So if a website um, 
that's got a trustee certification on it is going to send you some spam or steal your money, then what about if you could go after a trustee rather than going out um, after the company, which is probably not going to exist anymore? The certification authorities definitely do not want to do that. They go very much out of their way to um, promise absolutely nothing by giving one of these cert certificates out, but if so, what's the point of having it? There's also ways of improving regulation through publishing information. Um, so, for example, you could um, pu require that complaints against the organisation be published, and then you could see if this organisation um, has got more complaints than anyone else. Uh, this has now started to be done in the UK with the banking industry. The statistics of the number of complaints against each bank is being published in a fairly obscure place, but it's a start. Um, and similarly, search engines who have adverts could be required to do some auditing before they actually publish an advert. Um, they're currently not required to do that. They are doing that to a better or uh, worse extent. But although there are downsides of all of these, problem, all of these aspects, it's not necessarily the right approach to just do nothing. And that's predominantly what the industry is doing at the moment. So all the things I've been talking about so far. So there's information asymmetry, this market for lemons idea, um, externalities and liability dumping where the cost gets put down on someone else. Um, then there's also the lack of diversity that comes from economics. If you've got a network effect that encourages everyone to use the, the same sort of network, then you end up with having <coughs> systemic vulnerabilities. So now if you've got a hack on Windows, then you can take over most of the internet. And there's also a problem that comes from the fragmentation of legislation and law enforcement. Most fraud now on the internet is international, but law enforcement <coughs> agencies are national and the mechanisms for them to collaborate with each other don't work very well. And this is one of the reasons that it's so hard to get after criminals who operate on the internet. So, so there's some solutions that could also be examined. Um, these solutions were discussed in a paper that was um, produced for ENISA, um, European National Information Security Agency, which has got lots more detail on these. But essentially it was examining cases for regulation in the IT industry. This is important to realise because these sorts of things may come in. There is interest in governments looking at these. If you think that they're good, then maybe this will improve your situation. But if you think that they're bad, then you need to think about what you would do if these sorts of rules came and started affecting your business. Currently, it seems to mainly concentrate on self-regulation, reputation. This doesn't work all that well, but that's what we have at the moment. Um, one possibility is having a tax on digital pollution. Currently, if you're a factory and then you dump some pollution into the water, then you have to pay for that. You get fined or you have to pay some sort of tax. How about if ISPs were charged when their customers sent malware out on the internet. Of course, the ISPs think this is a terrible idea, but so do the people who receive uh, malware and spam from ISPs who don't do anything about it. Another possibility would be to look at the cap and trade system. This is how carbon is regulated, um, carbon dioxide. So you're encouraged to produce less carbon dioxide, but as an alternative to producing less carbon dioxide, you can buy carbon credits from some other party who will then plant trees somewhere else in the world. And this gives them the resources to reduce carbon in another way. So maybe ISPs that produce a lot of malware, rather than reducing their malware, could um, purchase carbon credits or pollution credits from other ISPs. It sounds a bit crazy, but it's possible it might even work. Another possibility would be joint liability. So suppose a, a customer 
gets some malware on their PC and that <coughs> PC hacks another PC, maybe the ISP should take some blame for that. Of course, they hate that, but uh, that would certainly give them an incentive to reduce the amount of bad stuff on their network. And then there's another possibility of a fixed penalty scheme. So if you get on a plane, or if you try to get on a plane, you've got a ticket, and then the plane company says, sorry, we're overbooked, you can't get on, then you can write to this company and get your money back, um, and you can, they have to pay a fine. Maybe the same thing should be applied to ISPs. So if you're getting spam from a particular ISP customer, you send a, a letter to, or some notification to the ISP, and they've then got, say, 12 hours, one hour, however long, to stop that spam coming. Thereafter, if you get any spam from that ISP or from that customer at the ISP, then you can charge them some fixed penalty. Again, ISPs hate this idea, but it would start giving the right incentives. As I mentioned, there is much interest in trying to push as much liability away from the software producers. And if you've ever looked at the end user license agreement that you get with software, it will say that the software company has absolutely no liability for anything whatsoever. Um, the software may work, it may not work, and it's entirely your problem whether or not it works. Now, in fact, many of these clauses are not, in fact, legal. So if you um, produce some software which malfunctions and causes someone to get killed or get injured, then you are liable under UK law. Doesn't matter whether you're a UK citizen or not. Um, doesn't matter what the license said. So far, this isn't so much of a problem because people tend not to uh, put computer software which is not certified protecting human life, but this is certainly going to start to change. And this is something you need to worry about if you're producing software. If it also is a big problem if you're going to produce open, so open source software because then you don't get a company to stand between you and the lawsuits. So maybe there should be some better regulation for this. Maybe there should be increased liability for companies and then reduced li liability for individuals producing software. There's various this opinions on whether this is a good thing. You can probably guess most of them. But this is something that governments are actively looking at and something that people producing software should be concerned about. So one potential strategy for dealing with um, the culture of impunity in software is um, to go with uh, approach which depends on the way that this software is going to be applied. So things like standalone embedded systems already are, tend to be covered by safety legislation because the whole product, including software and hardware, is covered by the same legislation. <coughs> and with network systems, the emphasis should be preventing, harm from, uh, preventing others from being harmed. So I mentioned the example that if you have malware on your computer, then chances are it won't affect you, it will affect other people. And so that means that there's an incentive to protect you, not much incentive to protect other people. And therefore, that's the thing which liability um, should concentrate on. And then there's also the question about open source development. So one possibility is that either the bundler or some organization which collects software, like the Apache Foundation, um, might take responsibility for software which malfunctions. So these options are discussed in the ENISA report. Um, there's one aspect which is just saying that contracts cannot dump liability on other parties when it comes to consumers some statutory rights to sue for damage. So if Microsoft produced a terrible operating system that results in spam on the internet, then you can go after Microsoft. This is already the case when it comes to software, uh, or comes to products which are sold. 
So if you buy um, a bit of software uh, or a, a product from one company which is manufactured by another, the consumer has a right to sue the company where they bought it from. They don't have to go all the way back up to the manufacturer. Um, this change in legislation was introduced a long time ago because manufacturers were doing nothing and um, the shop owner was doing nothing as well and putting liability on the shop owner encouraged the shop owner to um, introduce ways of improving the quality of the products that they sold. But it could be possible to just ignore the problem, it's what's being done at the moment, and then just let the market deal with it. It's arguably better than some other options, but it has a lot of downsides. And a final discussion point is um, insist by security by default. So currently, if you buy a, soft, a computer from PC World, say, chances are it is unsafe to use. If you plug it into the network, it will be wide open to a whole suite of vulnerabilities. You wouldn't buy a car without a seatbelt, so why is this acceptable for computers? So maybe computer vendors would be responsible for ensuring that the computer is patched up to date before they send it on to you. Where a lot of these problems actually hit consumers is in liability dumping, and in particular liability dumping in the financial markets. So here um, we can look at who has to pay the cost of unauthorised transactions um, in the finance industry. So I'll be talking about this in a bit more detail um, in my talk on banking security architecture. But there is quite a lot of variation even within the EU as to how customers get refunded for fraudulent transactions. Some countries are good, but the UK and to some extent Germany turned out to be um, quite bad in terms of pushing costs onto the customer. One of the reasons for this is different legislation and different practices. Um, if banks can push liability onto the customers and the law lets them do this, then they have less incentive on improving <coughs> security. This was supposed to be dealt with by the Payment <coughs> Services Directive, but the Payment Services Directive has a good set of clauses for dealing with customer complaints. It basically says that unless the bank can show that the customer authorised the transaction or the customer is negligent, then the bank has to give the money back. But the banks fought very long and hard to get this word put in, necessarily, into Article 59. And what they use this word to mean is if the bank records show that the customer authorised the transaction, the intention of the Payment Services Directive was to say that this was insufficient to show that the customer did authorise the transaction. But how it got fudged is to say that it's not necessarily sufficient to prove, but the UK banks, when they refer to this clause, say that even though this clause exists, exists because that word necessarily exists, if there is fraud on your account and their records show that you authorised it, then you are liable. And because it's very hard to sue banks in the UK, if you sue them and you lose, they'll probably charge so much that they'll take your house. There's very few people in the UK who actually have the opportunity to test this. So going up a bit, back to economic theory, one interesting set of papers is about um, the ways of analysing attack and defence. How this um, was imagined is Suppose that you had um, a world where there was danger of flooding and you had a, a circular country and the responsibility for flood defences was on the family which owned the patch of land next to the sea. So you had all these people responsible for flood defences and the flood defence of the country as a whole would be as strong as the weakest link of the entire system, and that's what computer security is for many purposes. Um, alternatively, suppose that it was a missile defence system protecting the country, then it depends, the security depends on the best effort of the best missile. Um, 
And there's other ways of looking at it as being a sum of contributions. So uh, maybe all these people could get together, invest in the resources to buy these best missiles. So obviously the first one is terrible and, um, and the last one, the sum of efforts, turns out to be optimal. And when you look at software, it turns out to be a mix because the quality of software depends on the, the worst effort of the least careful programmer. If you've got some terrible programmer introduces a vulnerability, that will be the one that will be exploited. But it also depends on the best effort of the security architect and the sum of efforts of the testers. So the moral of this is that you should hire fewer better programmers, more testers and top architects. So if you want to get into security architecture, then this suggests it's a good way to go. But all of these approaches do have significant limitations because they assume something called the rational actor. They assume that the people who make decisions in the system will do a careful ben um, cost-benefit analysis based on all information available and then take the optimum path. But actually, when you look at real people, this is very far, far, far away from what they actually do. And psychology when it's combined with economics, it's called behavioural economics, tries to build more realistic models of human behaviour. And we can learn from some of these examples um, when we look at computer security. But some of the most useful resources actually doesn't come from the academics, it comes from the criminals. So we'll give a few examples of what they've been doing. So <coughs> Many of you heard about social engineering. In the US, this is sometimes called pretexting. This is one way of extracting information from an organization. You call up, and then you persuade them to hand that information over. Although you, organizations which are into security metrics might well measure things like intrusion detection system alerts, they tend not to measure um, information on attacks against the organization through social engineering. One example where there was some analysis was a health authority in the UK in 1996. They trained all the staff answering telephones to recognise when something was um, social engineering. Um, what was, is very common for someone to receive a call about in working for a health authority is a doctor will call up, ask for some information about a patient that they're treating, and then get the receptionist to look this information up. What the receptionists were trained to do is, in all cases, take the name of the doctor who's calling and then look up the name and hospital of the doctor in the NHS telephone book and call the doctor back. In almost all cases, this was fine, but in 30 calls per week, it turned out that the doctor was contacted but had not actually put that request. So this was a social engineering uh, attack. These figures were reported to the health authority and the health authority ordered the researchers to stop the trial because they didn't want to know. More likely social engineering isn't going to be used by itself but it will be combined with technical attacks. So you call up, you get information about passwords or the um, ID of the one-time password tokens and then you can actually carry out um, technical attacks. And this is really the the bread and butter of what Kevin Mitnick was doing. The reason these attacks work is because people want to be helpful. The stories that Kevin Mitnick would come up with is quite often that he was a, a salesman stuck in the field. He wanted to um, make a big deal, but he couldn't get access to the corporate network because the, his one-time password had fallen in the river um, and he just needed uh, some way of logging in and then it would all be fine. And he persuaded people that he was a good chap and this should be allowed and then he got into their systems. Another way that people get tricked are through phishing emails. I'm sure you've all seen these. Um, most of these that you've seen are going to be pretty terrible, but these still work well enough to still be viable. Two-factor authentication systems help this a bit, but criminals have adapted by combining social engineering with malware. And what the malware does is make you think you're doing something when you're actually doing something else, and then 
you still type in your two-factor authentication token, whatever that is, and you think you're doing the transaction that you intended, but actually the fraudster has ran off with your money. And I'll be talking about, again, more detail in this, my banking security talk, because criminals are following the money, and the money belongs in the banking system, and that's what they're using as their target. We can start to explain why people get tricked by looking at how human brains differ from computers. It's not that people are just incompetent. The human brain is capable of doing things that computers are nowhere near capable of doing, but there are particular characteristic errors that it makes. Um, so one is a, a capture error. If you're used to doing something, then you'll continue to do it without thinking. Your brain optimizes the task of thinking about the individual task away and puts it on automatic pilot. Um, so for example, it's quite common that you're, you're driving to some place that's near your home and then you'll end up on the road that's going home rather than where you wanted to go because you're so used to doing that. In computer security, we see that users are trained that if you press OK, then things happen um, and they actually get their job done. So if you show a warning that says something terrible is happening, they're not going to read the warning, they're going to click OK and they're going to keep on doing. This is just human nature. You're not going to be able to change this. Another set of errors is post-completion errors. So after the job is done, errors are more likely to occur. We see this in ATMs. Um, when people go to an ATM, they go to take out money. Old ATMs would, first of all, give you the money and then ask you to take out the card. This is better from an IT perspective, but what would happen is people would leave their card in the ATM because once they've got their money, the job's done. So now ATMs force you to, first of all, take out your card and then take out your money. And this makes it much less likely that you'll leave your card in the ATM. And the reason that ATMs will do things like asking you, after you have your money, um, do you want to have another service? This seems a strange thing for them to ask, but they want to distinguish between the two cases. And then there's also following the wrong rules. So when there are multiple rules to follow, the strongest one wins. So this is a bit hard to see, but this is a URL that says paypal.secureauthentication.com. Now, if you know about URLs, you'll know that this belongs to secure authentication and who knows who they are, not PayPal. But the strongest rule that applies when looking for a brand is looking for the brand name. So the average person will think that this belongs to PayPal and teaching people to parse URLs is not going to be very effective. <coughs> and then there's also the cognitive model. So if you see a padlock in a browser, what does it actually mean? Um, the answer is that it depends on where it is. If it's um, in one side of the address bar, then it means it's the favourite icon and it means nothing. In the other side, it means it's SSL. This is not the sort of subtlety that users are going to be able to capture. Um, another set of biases are to do with perceptual bias. The rational actor model would have someone believe that it is exactly equivalent to win $100 versus avoiding losing $100. You're still up $100 on where you were, so it should be the same. This is not how humans think. If, first of all, you can run experiments that show that this is not the case. And secondly, you can put people in MRI scanners and see that people get the benefit, the, the good feeling, in entirely different areas of their brain when they win $100 versus not losing $100. There's also the availability heuristic. People remember things that are dramatic. People remember 9-11. They don't remember about news about one person dying in a car crash, even though you're far more likely to die in a car crash than in a terrorist attack. And they also worry more about problems where they are not in control. So people are more afraid of flying because, flying because they are, have to trust the pilot as competent, whereas most people think they're better than average drivers. And people get tricked by people in anonymous markets because the brain is not set up for correctly estimating risks in anonymous large markets. Our brain is still more or less wired up in the same way it was when we were living in very small groups. People also have a tendency to associate harm with moral harm. So 
one reason that people don't care about climate change is it's not seen to be socially unacceptable to take a, a five minute drive when you could be instead walking. So people are more wary about um, harm when there's hostile intent before it, whereas global warming is, is not hostile. Um, it's long term and it involves slow change. So global warming is almost optimum for a serious problem which is going to not cause attention from the society. I'll skip that one. But all these experiences, uh, all these scenarios do need to be taken with um, some caveats because everyone is different. So a lot of research on usability was done on computer students. Computing students tend to be predominantly male and one of the conclusions that came from this um, research is um, that men turned out to be um, worse at using computers, uh, sorry, men turned out to be better at using computers than women. So interesting, controversial. Turned out it was only because of the computer monitors in use. If you switch to a larger monitor, then this difference disappears. And it turns out that on average, women use peripheral vision more than men. And because the experiment wasn't taking this into account, it came to the wrong conclusion. Another problem for this research is that the subjects of research are typically weird. This is a term by Heinrich and Al. Um, they tend to be students, so they're white, educated, industrialised, rich and democratic. And this is almost the least representative sample for the average population that you can come up with. The reason is convenience. Um, psychology researchers are surrounded by psychology students um, and also all because of ethical concerns. It's far easier to do experiments um, in terms of paperwork on students than it is to do it on fruit flies. So does anyone know this optical illusion? So which, which line looks longer, top one or bottom one? Anyone want to see? Come on. The same. What, do they, what one looks longer? One above. one above. So you have seen this one. Yes, they are exactly the same. Um, this was a famous experiment done, um, but it was done on students in a US college. When you actually do this experiment on um, a much wider group of people, then you start to see some differences. So down here um, are a group of African tribes and many of them um, don't see any, uh, are not tricked by this. They think that the lines are exactly equal. Um, you can go to some other groups um, and then they start to see a smaller difference. The average European um, is in here, um, only adults were tested here. Um, and college students in the US are here. So college students are at the extreme for being tricked with this illusion. So actually the illusion is nowhere near as universal as people first thought. Excuse me, so yep. the higher it is, the more they have been tricked? Yes, so the higher they are, the more they think <coughs> that the top line is longer than the short line. So the people down here were not tricked, the people up here were tricked a lot. Okay, let's skip over some of these and go on to principles of scammers. So there was a paper done by um, Frank Stiano and Paul Wilson on looking at the techniques that scammers use for trying to trick people into doing the wrong thing. And there's a, a few of these principles. Um, one is um, distraction. So when a scam is going on, there'll be lots of other things going on which tries to distract you from um, what you're doing and then make it more likely that you're going to um, be tricked. Um, another one is social compliance. Try to act out the position of authority. Um, here, um, in the example they gave, it was a, a policeman who would come into an organisation and say, um, here's a pen that will help you detect counterfeits. Actually, it doesn't detect counterfeits, it's just a green pen. And then later on, one of the accomplices will come along with some fake notes. They'll be tested with the green pen, show up as being legitimate, and then the counterfeit gets passed off. Another one is the herd principle. Um, here, 
you're more likely to do something if someone else is going to um, do the same thing. So how scammers frequently work is they'll get someone else to come along and then um, who works with the fraudsters to do something and then wait for the mark to come and then do it later. Um, another interesting one is the dishonesty principle. People are more likely to be gullible when they're doing something bad. So we can see this um, in one of these um, videos which I can show you later. But another one is this email. Um, probably a bit too small, but this is a person that is um, saying that there's a, a letter that's being sent to you with a, a check for $2 million US dollars, um, and it's been misdirected. And this person thinks it's for you. You obviously know it's not. And they're relying on the recipient of this email trying to scam this person who apparently works for the United Nation in order to get this $2 million. Now, of course, the, this person will try to scam you back and they're a lot better at it than you. But they're taking advantage of the fact that they're going for dishonest people and dishonest people are much more likely to fall for the scam. Um, another one is um, deception. Fraudsters rely on making it seem as if they are not who they are. Um, so they might um, appear to be one person, but they're actually someone else. You saw that person in, in the UN. And I will show you a quick video um, about one of these scams. This is the Ballet Steel. A smart boutique hotel in Manchester must be a good place for a hustler to find some rich pickings. And Paul's here to try his luck. He loiters outside, keeping an eye on the guests checking in to see if they have anything worth lifting. It doesn't take long for something to catch his eye. A pricey looking sports car. But how is he going to get his hands on it? Watch closely. Not suspecting that they're being watched, the marks go to check in. Inside, we've rigged hidden cameras to follow the action. And while the hotel staff are busy with the new arrivals, Paul slips in and takes a seat in the lobby. Keith Spencer. G-I-L-F-E-A-T-K-G-I-L. He's now in a good position to overhear the conversation between the mark and the receptionist. Get number 16. Um, Having taken up the hotel's parking service, the mark fills out the valet receipt. Only on presentation of this receipt will his car be returned. With checking complete, the marks are shown to their room. Okay, enjoy the, <laughs> the valet packs the car, and Paul starts a waiting game. For this scam to work, he needs the receptionist to leave her post. But she's not budging. But time is on Paul's side. Eventually, it's the afternoon shift change. And when the receptionist's replacement turns up, they leave the desk to hand over the shift. This is Paul's chance. He quickly heads to the lobby and picks up a form from the front desk without anyone noticing. He's got himself a blank valet receipt. Now all he has to do is fill it out. Outside, he noted down the Mark's car registration, and in the lobby, he overheard their name. And room number. Once the form's complete, Paul heads to the front desk. Excuse me, you're valet. Yes, it is. Are you at the cabin now? Uh, I, I need to go now, please. Okay. Possible. I'll just be at the bar having a coffee. They cross-reference the details of Paul's receipt at the hotel computer. The new receptionist and valet weren't there when the car was dropped off, so they've no reason to doubt Paul. Satisfying everything's in order, the valet goes to collect the car and hands it over to Paul. Okay, so Paul Wilson, um, the author, is that person there. 
So he's one of the people who appeared in this TV program. So there you saw the deception principle. You also um, saw the time principle. So here the receptionist is put on pressure. This person says that he needs to travel now. So they're less likely to do the checks that they need to do. Um, another principle is the, the need and greed principle. The scammers will try to work out what people need and then go after that. Um, one of Paul Wilson's saying is that he's able to scam anyone. You just need to know what people need. OK, so in conclusion, I hope I've justified that the amateurs that are studying cryptography, but if you're a professional security person, you should be studying the economics and the psychology to get a full picture. I've explained some security failures, um, how that um, these security failures apply to information security, um, and how, although economics is useful, its predictive power is limited by, uh, limited by the unrealistic assumption that, of the rational actor. And if you want to learn more about how people are actually going to behave, then look how criminals behave in trying to exploit people and then see if you can use these powers for good. And I've got some more videos that I'm happy to show you if you're interested. But I think you deserve your copy break now. Okay, thank you.